In this lecture, we're going to uh, continue challenging the assumptions of the dominant culture, both the dominant worldly culture and, to far too great a degree, the dominant church culture as well, in search of that which is our stated goal to study in this entire series, a radically Christian counterculture. And as I have said, uh, I believe that radical faithfulness to the teachings of Jesus, if followed by a community of people, would generate a countercultural phenomenon. And one of the things that is an aspect of every culture is its assumptions about the, the relationship between men and women. Just as in our last lecture we talked about a fundamental assumption of every culture is uh, it has some, some kind of assumptions about the, uh, the view of oneself. So the view of the opposite sex is another very important aspect of culture. There are some Muslim cultures where women cannot be seen in public by other men uh, without veiling themselves thoroughly, having almost nothing showing except maybe their eyes and their, uh, even their hands have to be covered. Uh, I know because I have some friends who are missionaries in Muslim lands. In fact, there are some parts, I think, of Pakistan, if I'm not mistaken, and this is not universal throughout the Muslim world, but there are some places where women are never, ever allowed to go outside the door of their house. They're never allowed outside. Uh, on the other hand, we have the extreme opposite of that in Western culture today, where not only are uh, women allowed to uh, talk, to men, uh, but they're uh, allowed practically to undress in front of the public. Of course, some actually undress all the way and make a living of it, but even those who are more mainstream generally undress to a degree that would be considered shocking and is considered shocking by more moral cultures than ours. And I would sadly have to say the Islamic cultures, at least in outward norms in this respect, are more moral than ours. Now, I don't believe the Muslims have morality in their hearts, and I believe they have as much problem with lust and so forth as anybody else does, but, and that's probably why they cover their women so thoroughly, uh, so that they can maintain some semblance of morality. But uh, we have uh, thrown off all of those things, and, and now uh, we can go out practically uh, with, with so little on, especially in the summertime and at poolside or at the beach, that uh, in many cases it would be no different than if we had nothing on. I remember my wife said that before she was a Christian, and she didn't, she didn't get saved until she was in college, but when she was in her teenage years, she said though she had no really Christian morals or no fear of God or anything like that, every summer when she took out, went out for the first time to the poolside in her bathing suit, she felt embarrassed. She didn't tell anyone or show it because it would, she seemed like it would be really uncool. Of course, women wear bathing suits out at the poolside, but she said she felt really embarrassed about it and for the first few times, and then she got used to it, and the rest of the summer she had no modesty at all. And I think that's really interesting, because it means that our culture is teaching people to deny their instinctive modesty. And people feel an instinctive modesty until they harden themselves against it. And in biblical times, uh, in the Jewish culture, for example, and by the way, we're not studying uh, a radically Jewish counterculture, but a radically Christian counterculture, so I'm not arguing that this is how we should do things, but in the days of Jesus, men and women did not speak to each other in public. That's why when Jesus was violating that norm and speaking to a woman at the well, his disciples returned from town where they'd gone to buy food, and they marveled that he spoke to a woman. Now, there were exceptions. There were women who spoke uh, in public to men, but uh, usually it caused a scandal of some kind if they did. It was simply not proper. So obviously each culture has its own ideas about the degree to which men and women interact with each other, what, they, what is proper, what is not proper, how much communication, how much exposure to each other is considered to be acceptable. Where I used to live in Santa Cruz, California, laws were passed just a few years ago to make it legal for men and women alike to walk down the street topless. There's no law requiring a woman to wear clothing on her upper half of her body in Santa Cruz uh, in any public place. Uh, but that's, that's not very radical. Uh, when I lived in Santa Cruz, you'd find people totally naked on the beaches at times, and sometimes locked in embrace and all kinds of horrible things. And I say horrible, not caring whether someone thinks me a prude. There are terrible things in our culture. The worst of it is that the church is acclimating to it. The church 
doesn't want to be very old-fashioned, doesn't want to be very far behind the world in these things. And I suppose the world could go all the way toward total nudity, and it wouldn't be very long before the church felt like they needed to be a little open-minded about issues like that, if someone happened to show up nude. Now, you might think, never. But, of course, our culture hasn't even gotten that way completely. But I dare say the church, since it has lost its bearings to a large extent and is not making it even its goal to radically challenge the culture with radically Christian norms, I don't see anything that would moor the church to a holier standard than that. Uh, unless Christianity gets back to saying, let's challenge everything about the pagan culture and go back to what Jesus said, what the apostles taught, what the Bible teaches generally, and then we will find out how all these categories should be lived out. And this category is a big one. And I want to say at the beginning a couple of things. The things I'm going to say, first of all, will go against most of your grain. And frankly, it goes against my grain too. I might as well make that plain. There is hardly any category of the radically Christian uh, counterculture that I'll be discussing in this series of lectures that I myself violated more than that which I'm about to address. Now, I don't want to give the impression that I was a womanizer. Far from it. I had far higher standards than most of my contemporaries, even in the church. I was raised in a Baptist church, a, con a, a conservative church. And my standards of conduct, I, should, I shouldn't say my standards, I should say my behavior toward the obvious sex, to, to the obvious, the altered, the opposite sex. Let me get started here. My behavior toward the opposite sex, you can tell I get really nervous when I start talking about this, was much, much cleaner than that of most of the others in my youth group, though in my heart I didn't have the standards that I'm now talking about. I simply didn't have the opportunity. I was a late bloomer, I was an ugly duckling, I didn't have a lot of opportunity to uh, mix romantically with the opposite sex, and the people who had more gifts in those areas uh, expressed them. I probably would have done so myself had I had the opportunity. It is, a, it is a blessing of God that God did not make me physically attractive because my character was not such as would have protected me in those days. However, once I got older and grew my hair long, in a day when long hair was all that it took to be cool, um, suddenly there were women who did somehow find me attractive and there were opportunities. But by then I had a somewhat more spiritual mindset, fortunately. Uh, probably once I grew my hair out, it cleared my brain. But uh, actually, I, I didn't grow my hair out until I really, uh, until I got filled with the Spirit and, and became more spiritually minded generally. So even though there were women who were attracted to me, I was somewhat more protected by inward standards and inward spirituality than I would have been at an earlier time. And so I still uh, maintained my essential virginity until I was married. And uh, in that, most people would say, well, you did pretty good for your generation. And I'm afraid I'd have to say, sadly, that is pretty good for my generation. But it's not very good. My mind, my behavior, my assumptions, my standards were still far, far lower than that which I find in Scripture. And therefore, I start out with a confession that if I present what sounds like a very high standard here, I don't want to pretend like this is the standard that I lived up to when I was in my teenage or early tw 20s years. Fortunately, I did come to some of these convictions after my first wife ran off and divorced me and before I entered into a, another marriage. I did have some of these convictions, but uh, not all of them. Uh, for me, since what I'm about to teach goes directly against the grain of the culture, it was not something I just saw instantly. It, it, was, it was sort of a growing process. And for that reason, I don't expect you, if you haven't thought about these things before, to immediately embrace them. I expect it to be against your grain as well. It certainly goes against my carnal grain, and I've got plenty of that. Uh, it goes against the grain of what I lived when I was in my courting uh, years, at least in my teenage years and, and my early 20s. But uh, the fact that I did not live this way when I was your age does not mean that what I have to say uh, should be discounted. I did, by the way, in later years when I was... Uh, thrust into singleness again by my first wife divorcing me, and then a, th a third time into singleness when my second wife was killed, uh, I did have opportunity to, I got another chance, got another chance to, to live by biblical principles. Um, 
But another chance doesn't mean you can wipe away the past. And the past has been destructive in my life, in my character. And I still have struggles that I would probably not have to the same degree had I known these principles when I was younger. And it is because of this that I want to pass them on to you, that you could live for the glory of God to a higher degree than I knew to do. And the reason I didn't know to do it is my parents didn't know to do it. My parents were Christians, good Christians. I mean, it, by the standards of our church, they were wonderful Christians. But there were assumptions about boy-girl relationships in their culture growing up, in the Christian college they both went to, and so forth. And it, uh, frankly, I, what I have to share on this subject, I don't mean to say I'm now presenting to you the consensus of all conservative Christians on this subject. As a matter of fact, I'd say 90% of conservative Christians would probably not agree with me initially on this. At least if you ask their opinions, they wouldn't give these opinions initially. But let me just ask you not to reject what I have to say unless you can find more scriptural support for your rejection than I can present for my position. All right? If, if you don't find what I say to be scriptural, then reject it in favor of what you find to be more scriptural, not what you prefer, but what you find more scriptural. And you can let me know what that is if you don't think what I'm saying is scriptural. Now, I'm going to break this lecture into three parts. The first is an affirmation that most Christians would not agree with until they read the scripture, and, 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 uh, and maybe even then some wouldn't. And that is the affirmation that marriage is the only environment for romance. It's the only legitimate environment for romance. Now, that doesn't mean that people cannot have any romance before they're married. But I believe that the only romance that God ever intended for people was between themselves and their spouse. Of course, they feel some romance toward each other before they're married. They very probably wouldn't marry if they didn't feel that beforehand. But the point is, what I'm saying is that God did not design us to have a series of romances, casual romances, just recreational romances. And that's really what our culture and the church basically endorses these days. Is, I mean, it, it didn't start with the church. The church didn't initiate this. They hardly initiate anything. But the fact is the world, for about a century now, has believed in recreational romance as a normal activity for young people. Now, prior to the beginning of this century, from what I've been told, dating as we know it was not part of, uh, part of the process of finding a mate. And not in this lecture, but in another, I will talk to you about what I think is the biblical alternative to dating. But let me just say this. The church has accepted dating, the church has accepted recreational romance, short-term romance and so forth as normative, and uh, basically the most radical teaching you're likely to hear is, uh, you know, uh, James Dobson teaching about how to behave on your dates in a uniquely Christian way. But uh, very seldom do you hear people challenging dating. Now, I, I take that back. Dr. Dobson has had guests on who actually say they didn't believe in dating and they went for something else, and that's fine. I'm not here to pick on Dr. Dobson, not in the least. I'm saying that I'm thinking of him as a, as a major Christian cultural voice uh, among conservatives. And I'm saying that uh, he has said some of the kinds of things that I believe we need to say. I, I just don't know anybody, or not very many people, who are saying all of them. I'm not sure I'm saying all of them, but I'm going to work at it. I believe that it can be established biblically that in God's plan, the only environment for romance is marriage. And I, I would include, by the reference to marriage, pot, you know, the future spouse. But not just a potential spouse. You see, this is where I was mistaken growing up. I knew that just to date for fun, because I didn't have anything else to do on a weekend, that that was carnal, and that was using people, and it wasn't, it wasn't godly. But I did think that so long as marriage was a potential, that dating and encouraging a romantic relationship with a woman was, was legitimate, even if I didn't have any strong conviction that I would marry this person, or certainly no, I had not made any decision to marry this person, but it was possible. I knew, or at least my conviction was in my teenage years and my early 20s, that if I dated, I should be dating someone that I would be seriously interested in marrying. Now, that, that, in that, I was more radical and more pure than most of the people in my youth group. But even that, I believe, was compromised. I'm not talking about you should only formulate romance with people that you might conceivably be interested in dating if things worked out. But I personally believe that God intended for you to have one romance of a lifetime. Now, not everything happens the way God intended for it, partly because there's a fall. God never intended there to be divorce. But because there was a fall, and because of the hardness of hearts, God permitted divorce in the Old Testament. God never intended there to be polygamy. That's not God's highest. 
but God permitted people in the Old Testament to, to practice polygamy. And there are, uh, there are things that have come into cultures that God never really wanted to be there, but they are there, and some of them God is willing to tolerate. I'm not going to be legalist about this. I'm just going to tell you what I believe the Bible teaches, and you can do what you believe God would have you do with it. But God did not allow Adam, the first and perfect man before the fall, at least innocent man, he did not allow him more than one romance in his lifetime. He didn't make several women and let Adam take his pick after dating several and deciding which one would be the most pleasing to him after getting his feet wet and getting some experience in the area of romance. Uh, there was one woman, one man. Now, when Jesus was asked about divorce in Matthew chapter 19, uh, he said, well, you know, God makes the two one, and what God has joined together, let not man put asunder. And the Pharisees said, well, then why did Moses permit us to divorce our wives and, uh, or command us to give a writing of divorcement? Jesus said, well, because of the hardness of the heart, God permitted you to divorce wives, but from the beginning it was not so. And that line, from the beginning it was not so, is to my mind definitive of Jesus' teaching about Christian norms in relations with men and women, in marriage and whatever. Because Jesus said, okay, what Moses allowed after the fall, that's, that's one thing. But what I'm teaching you is what God had in mind at the very beginning, the way it was before things fell, back when God said, it is very good. If you're interested in what is very good in the sight of God, you're going to have to go back beyond the law of Moses, back to before the fall, and say, how was it in the beginning? Because God made it just the way he wanted it. Furthermore, we know from the New Testament that God made uh, the relationship between man and woman originally as a depiction of Christ and the church. And that uh, Paul says in Ephesians chapter 5 that there are many things about marriage that should be brought into conformity with that imagery of Christ and the church, because that's exactly what God had in mind. So when we think about man and woman and relationship, we have to say, well, what did God have in mind? Not what can we get away with, not how much compromise is permissible to a saved person, but what is the ideal? And the reason I say this is not out of legalism. We have to be perfect, and if you're not perfect, you're going to go to hell. That's not my position. My position is that God ordained and designed things the way they work best for all parties concerned, for his glory and for your benefit and for the benefit of society. And where God's pattern is deviated from, problems arise. Problems, some of them that are lifelong in their consequences. And I don't, it's not a matter, like I said in an early lecture, it's not a matter of legalism, it's a matter of wisdom. It's a matter of just bringing one's conduct into conformity with what God designed human conduct to be. Because he knows what, what he designed us for. And when we do something different, we invite disaster. And in our society, to the degree that it has gotten further and further and further from God's standards in this particular respect, and every society that has done so, it has courted and married itself to disaster already. You might say, well, our, our society is still prospering economically. Who cares? Our society is a disaster. Marriages are falling apart. Half the kids are being raised by single parents. Teen pregnancy, abortion. These things are symptoms of the violation of these very things we're talking about today. And don't tell me that anything short of getting back to God's standard is the right way to solve these problems. Now, God designed things in the beginning for one man to have one woman for life. The fall brought about an interruption because they had to die. God didn't originally make them to die. He made them to live forever. But they, they didn't, and so the fall has changed some things. But, but the fact of the matter is, if we would say, does God, did God make us to play the field and have many romances and break, get our hearts broken and break other people's hearts and so forth? I mean, this, the, is this just part of growing up in God's economy? It wasn't part of Adam's arrangement that God made, which he said was very good. He hasn't said that about any of the modern culture's uh, ways of you know, dealing between the sexes. I believe that the New Testament and the Old Testament both establish that God intends a man to have one woman, in a lifetime. And I'm not just talking about marriage, you see. A lot of people think, well, yeah, sure, with sex, of course, you're not supposed to have sex with someone who you're not married to, but what's wrong with a little kissing and hugging and, and romance and going steady and dating? Well, you tell me what's wrong. How pure are your thoughts these days and how much of that have you done? Let me, and let me ask you something. When you marry someone, how much of that will you hope they have done with other people? Jesus said, as you would have others do to you, do to them. When you get married, how many other romances will you hope that your spouse has had before they met you? What's the, what's the maximum amount you'd allow? 
or that you'd per, in a perfect world. I mean, obviously, most of us, because we live in a corrupted world, we all marry someone who, unless we, we're childhood sweethearts with the one we marry, we all end up marrying usually someone who's already had a crush on someone else or, or you know, more. But if, if you could have it the way you want it, now you might not know because you're not married. I'll tell you how you want it when you're married. It's amazing how possessive you become when you're married, that you're not before you're married. It's amazing how jealous you become once you're married when you weren't. I'll tell you something. It, when you are married, if you don't know this already, I'll tell you. And, and if you don't believe me, you'll find out. You will wish that your spouse had never had a romantic thought toward anyone before you. And that is because that's what God designed. And you'll adjust. In fact, you might think well, it's uncool for me to be jealous of these former boyfriends or former spouses or former whatevers of my spouse. Uh, you know, we, no, none of us want to be uncool. But we might as well be about as uncool as the truth demands. There's reason to be jealous. God is jealous over his bride too. And it's, it, it doesn't enhance our relationship with God that we had many idols before, that we had other lovers before. It doesn't really uh, prepare us for a better relationship with God by having some test runs with some other religious, you know, concepts. And a lot of people say, well, dating, you need to date a lot of people just to prepare for marriage. You got to get people dating when they're about, what, 14, 15, 16? Got to prepare for marriage. That recreational short-term romance doesn't prepare anyone for marriage. It prepares them for divorce. It's a preparation for divorce, and it is in our society where dating has become normative, which it was not in any society before the beginning of this century, how much divorce has increased in this century. Why? Because you, you get it through your head, I'm, this person excites me, I'm infatuated with this person, I want to be with this person, but when I stop being infatuated with them, when I stop wanting to be with them, well, there's always others out there. There's many fish in the sea. Let's leave that one behind. They'll get over it. They'll find someone else. I'll find someone else. Well, once they bring that into marriage, it's a hard habit to break. They say break it up is hard to do, but it gets easier with practice. And you get used to the idea that your relationship that is romantic in nature, you'll probably, if you're not planning to marry that person, you'll get used to the fact, you, you, you're going to break up someday. I mean, if you don't marry them, you're going to break up with them. There's only two options. I'm always amazed when I hear the secular music these days. It didn't seem strange to me when I was a teenager. It does now with my present mindset. That secular music, you find the guy or the girl so often bemoaning the fact that their boyfriend, their girlfriend, went off with someone else at the party. You know, it's my party and I'll cry if I want to, my generation said. And, you know, um, it's, what's her name, Judy's Turn to Cry or something like that. There's a lot of old songs I grew up with in the 50s and 60s about, you know, broken hearts. And there's plenty of them since then. I noticed that when I'm over at 7-Eleven, they're playing the oldies, you know, a lot of the Beatles songs are complaining that, you know, this person didn't remain faithful to me. They found someone else. And I think, wait a minute, what are they thinking? Were they committed for life? If so, then they should have gotten married. If they weren't committed for life, then what'd they expect but that someday they're going to go off with someone else? I mean, what, what other option is there? If they're not committed for life, then they're not committed for life. And if you're going to put your heart out there for someone and not have a lifetime commitment to that person, then what are you going to expect? But someday they're going to be interested like that in someone else. Excuse me. And uh, there's not going to be a commitment. Write that down there. <laughs> And so, I believe that everyone in their heart knows what the Bible teaches is true. They're just afraid to be out of step with the culture to say it strongly. And that is that really what God designed people for, like Adam and Eve, is one person for another person for life. One romantic relationship for life. Romance outside of that relationship, I'm going to suggest to you, is wrong. And I'll support that with scripture as we go along. Let's start out by looking at a few uh, important scriptures. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. We'll be looking at this chapter uh, on many occasions during this lecture because it has a lot to say relevant to the subject. But the opening verses of 1 Corinthians 7 say, Now concerning the things of which you wrote to me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Now, let me just pause here a minute because some translations read differently. The NIV says it is good for a man not to marry. This is not a translation. This is an interpretation. The word in the Greek is touch. 
Now, it may be correct that Paul is talking about marriage when he says this statement, but he doesn't use the word marriage, and it's possible he has something more besides in mind. I don't appreciate translators who interpret rather than translate, because it doesn't give me the opportunity to know what Paul really said and decide whether I agree with their interpretation or not. If you're reading the NIV, it'll say it's good for a man not to marry. Now, maybe it is good for a man not to marry. That's another issue. That's not what Paul said. It may be what he meant, but it may not be all that he meant. He said it is good for a man not to touch a woman. The word touch is hapto in the Greek, and it has a variety of meanings. It can mean touch, just like I'm touching this podium right now. It can mean cling to, and that's what I think it meant when Jesus said to Mary Magdalene after his resurrection, don't touch me, don't cling to me, most new translations say, because I have yet to ascend to my father. He, he wanted her not to hang on to him. In the King James, he said, it renders it, don't touch me. It's the same word, hapto. But it has the meaning in many places of cling to. And if that's what Paul means here, he may be using it as a, as a sort of a figure of speech for marriage, not to cling to or be joined to a woman. That's what marriage is. Um, it also has, in rare occasions, or less, or fairly rare in the scripture, the meaning of igniting or, or setting, lighting a fire, to, to touch off a fire, to start a fire. Uh, it is used that way at times in the scriptures. In Acts chapter 28, when Paul was shipwrecked, it says we lit a fire. The word lit is hapto, same thing. So there's about three different meanings for this word that, that Paul might have in mind. It's hard to say which one he has. It could mean it's simply good not to ever touch a woman if you're a man, or not to cling to a woman, perhaps meaning in the sense of marriage, or possibly not to kindle a fire in a woman. I don't know that that, I, frankly, that's the least likely meaning, in my opinion, though it would be the best for preaching. Some interpretations make great preaching, but they're not very good exegesis. But I, but, I mean, Paul later did say that a man is better to marry than to burn, right? And he's talking about sexual desire. So it is not out of the question that his statement, good not to hapto a woman, could mean to kindle, to start a fire in her. But I don't think that's the likely meaning. But anyway, whatever his meaning is, he said there's something that is good. And it has to do with man and woman relationships. It's good for a man not to touch a woman. Let's just keep it as it is right now for the moment. He says, nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, let each man have his own wife and let each woman have her own husband. Now, what Paul is, now he goes on to say he actually would like people to stay single if they can. We'll talk about that as another option. But what Paul indicates here is, while it is good for a man to keep his hands off a woman, there are people for whom the temptation is sufficiently strong that they're likely to fall into immorality if they don't have a legitimate outlet for this drive, and therefore, he says, let everyone have a husband or a wife for this purpose. Now, of course, the purpose of husband and wife is not just for uh, releasing sexual tension, but Paul is saying that within marriage, there is a legitimate outlet for those energies that otherwise may manifest in immorality. Now, notice the two options Paul states. There's one thing that's good, but here's, a, here's something that's a concession. The good thing is that a man doesn't touch a woman. As a concession, of course, there are situations in which a man could touch a woman legitimately in marriage. So to avoid immoral touching of a woman, get married. Now, Paul doesn't indicate that there's a third option, and that is to have a series of enjoyable romantic relationships without getting married. It's either get married or keep your hands off. That's how I understand Paul. You can understand him differently if you have a better way, biblically, to see it. Frankly, I can't see any reason why a man needs to get his hands on a woman, unless he's pulling her up when she's tripped or something like that. I mean, I, I, we would be, of course, it's stupidly legalistic if we meant that, you know, to give someone a pat on the back or to shake hands with a woman or to pull her up when she's falling or, do, or in some other senses. I mean, touching a woman can be very non-arousing. But clearly, when Paul says, but to avoid immorality, he's obviously talking about arousing kind of contact. And there's plenty of that that goes on in the average date of non-Christians and too many Christians. I believe it is possible that people could date without getting involved in this kind of thing, but it's very difficult to imagine dating with no intention of at least arousing romantic feeling. Now, we may not equate romantic feeling with sexual feeling, but what else is it? I don't have romantic feeling toward my sister or my daughters or toward... For that matter, my son, or toward my staff here. I, I don't have romantic feelings for it. Why? Because I, there's no sexual, you know, there's no sexual dynamics happening there. Uh, it may be 
that we in our own minds for the sake of justification will say, well, this is romantic, but it's not sexual. But in my opinion, romance is simply the prelude to sex in marriage and that it doesn't belong in other relationships. I believe we can establish this biblically. Let me turn your attention. As I, I, I mentioned in 1 Corinthians, I think Paul indicated that there's two possibilities, two, two options open. One is to keep your hands off a woman in the sense of, you know, I believe, uh, arousing physical contact. And the other is to not keep your hands off and get married, uh, but in reverse order. Um, Proverbs chapter 5, verses 15 through 20. Solomon, who was not a very good example of living up to his own preaching on these matters, but remember, a person who makes mistakes can be a very good preacher to younger people who haven't made those mistakes yet. Solomon made plenty of mistakes in the area of uh, romance, uh, but he knew how to talk about it to his son. He said in verse 15, and he uses this idea of drinking waters from a cistern, uh, satisfying a thirst or a craving, of course. He uses it as a metaphor for sexual craving and for sexual expression. He says, drink water from your own cistern, meaning your own wife, and running water from your own well. Should your fountains be dispersed abroad, streams of water in the streets? Let them be your, only your own and not for strangers with you. Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice with the wife of your youth. As a loving deer and a graceful doe, let her breast satisfy you at all times and always be enraptured with her love. For why should you, my son, be enraptured with an immoral woman and be embraced in the arms of a seductress? Now notice, of course he's no doubt when he talks about being enraptured and being embraced, he's probably talking about going all the way, right, with a, with a prostitute or something like that, or with a harlot. But he doesn't say so. He says, why should you be embracing? Why should you be enraptured? Why should you be aroused with a woman who is not your wife, is what he's asking. I mean, he's, he's essentially saying you shouldn't. He says, let your fountain be blessed with your own wife. Let her alone, let her body and your contact with her body be the only the only arousing expression of love between you and another woman. Now, Solomon gives all of his advice to his son, and so he talks about the seductress and so forth. Of course, if he was talking to his daughter, he'd have to talk about the seducing male and so forth. It's, it cuts both ways, obviously. But again, I would say this. It is very clear from the Old and the New Testament that God designed that people should have one spouse in a lifetime, except the fall, I mean... Divorce happens, widowhood happens, second marriages are said to be legitimate in a less than perfect world, but it's not the ideal. No one should plan for a series of marriages in their youth. They should plan on one. That's what I planned on. I've only planned on one. Uh, and, and the ideal is that you have one person in a lifetime that you're romantic with, and boy, is that a whole lot happier. Now, when you're young and you got the juices flowing and stuff like that, you might think it'd be a lot happier to have a whole lot of variety. You know, it was, it was uh, Ben Franklin who said, variety is the spice of life, and he left enough illegitimate children in France to prove that he was serious about it. But there are some things we need to consider that are, we are rarely told in the church or elsewhere. They're on your notes. <laughs> First point. By the way, some of the things I'm saying are not original. I've heard other people say, I've never heard anyone say this particular thing. Maybe you have, but... I thought this was original with me. Sexual hormones are designed for reproductive activity, and experimenting with them is even more dangerous than experimentation with other consciousness-altering chemicals. What do you think about Christians experimenting with consciousness-altering chemicals? Are not sexual hormones consciousness-altering? Now, I hope none of you have enough experience to be able to answer that question. I'll speak to you as one who was in measure defiled by somewhat by my ignorance and somewhat just by my self-deception and lust. Hormones alter the consciousness. I mean, women know this. On a monthly basis, they discover this. Men have the same problem. Uh, you read the story of... Um, oh, well, I didn't think I'd forget the name. Um, uh, David's son. I, I know his name. Of course, it never occurs to me when I want to use it. Um, Amnon. 
David's son Amnon and his half-sister Tamar. The Bible says he was enraptured with her, he was infatuated with her. He was sick because he couldn't marry her because she was his half-sister until he raped her. And then what to say? Instantly he hated her. Instantly, he, his, the hatred he had for her exceeded the love that he had for her before. Well, that was some kind of love, huh? Love never fails. I don't think he had what we call, what we're supposed to call love, but he had what most people call love. It was hormonal. Unfulfilled hormonal cravings. But as soon as it was satisfied, suddenly he was, his consciousness was altered because the hormones were no longer dominating. Hormones will make someone look beautiful to you. They, once you marry them, you wake up next to them and say, what did I ever see in that person at times? That's not true of my wife, of course. I married a very beautiful woman. But, but the fact of the matter is hormones do change the way you think and feel and see. So does LSD. So does cocaine. So does marijuana. But we don't allow people to experiment with those. Why do churches allow their young people to experiment with hormones? I'm not talking about injections. I'm talking about the hormones that are there by nature. Because of my uh, late bloomer status, as I said earlier, I didn't date when I was in, er in my early teens at all. I, I didn't have anyone interested in dating me, and I didn't ask, because I knew they wouldn't be interested. That was just fine. I'm glad it was that way, looking back. At the time, I thought maybe I was a little deprived, but uh, the fact of the matter is I, I really never got very sexually aroused. My hormones never got stirred up in that situation. It was really something. I mean, most people talk about masturbation as if it's some kind of a universal practice. I didn't even know what it was. I was married before I even knew what masturbation meant. I mean, if you don't go out on dates, if you don't do those things that stimulate the hormones, it's amazing how free you can remain from the insanity of lust run rampant. But when you get young people who've got their hormones just starting to act up, and you put them together in situations that are calculated to arouse, even if they don't have sex together, you're getting those things. That's chemicals, man. Those are consciousness-altering chemicals, and they, and they belong in a certain setting. They don't belong outside that setting, and that setting is marriage. People's hearts are not commodities or playthings for you to amuse yourself with. When you look at an attractive person of the opposite sex and you think, boy, I'd like to go out with that person. Why? Well, maybe you think, I'd like to marry that person, but I doubt that that's the first thought in mind because, I mean, you, you, the attraction is usually there before you know enough about them to know whether you'd want to marry them or not, right? I mean, I, I've always been attracted to a woman long before I knew enough about her to know if I, I mean, the physical attraction, before I knew whether she'd make a good wife or not. The desire to be with the person is because it seems like it'd be fun. It'd be fun to be with someone like that. It feels good to have someone uh, beautiful uh, attracted to you and so forth. Even if you don't do any immoral things, uh, it's just a, it's kind of an ego trip. Uh, I mean, that's part of the thing. There's other factors involved. Ego, lust. But um, the thing is, the heart of another person is not mine to play around with. We just think it is because our movies and TV shows and, and high school and, and junior high school, you know, cultures teach us that, you know, well, every, every weekend go to a different party and make out with someone else in the, in the corner. Uh, that is normal in our culture and it's normal in the youth groups of the churches in many cases. And most of the parents think, isn't that cute? That's what we did when we were their age. It never occurs to them that these people are plain with immorality. In fact, they're more than plain with it. Some of them are right in the middle of it. Even if they don't sexually consummate anything, their hearts are there. Remember what Jesus said, to look at a woman with lust after her, or to look at a woman to lust after her, is to commit adultery in the heart? You want to tell me that these junior high kids making out in the corner, that they don't have lust? This is adultery, according to Jesus, and the church thinks so little of it. Of course, no, no surprise, the church thinks very little of adulterous remarriages in many cases. Or simply adulterous affairs that are going on in the, in the church. Not all churches, but you'll find many churches that that's that way. And so what's, what's a little bit of adultery young, among the youth? It may not be what your flesh wants to hear, but I believe your heart will tell you the truth. That if you become romantically involved with another person, that person is not your spouse for life, you are 
playing with them for your own amusement. And human hearts are not commodities to play with. They're not playthings. It says in Proverbs chapter 6 and verse 26, For by means of a harlot, a man is reduced to a crust of bread. That means uh, he's just there to satisfy an appetite. The harlot has an appetite. Well, actually, what she, may be, she may be buying bread with the money he pays her. Or she may just be a wanton woman. And he's just like a piece of bread to her, something to satisfy a hunger. Certainly that's the case with many men. I'm surprised that he, he applies that to the woman as much as he does, but it's because he's warning his son. But uh, it seems to me like men are worse offenders than this. Uh, men are, seem to me more likely, maybe I'm naive, but in my experience it seems like men are more likely to look at a woman as a piece of meat than a woman is toward a man, but I know it goes both ways. In any case, that is worldly, carnal, we might even say demonic thinking. It's an absolute corruption and perversion of what God intended for the purity of male and female relationships. That, you know, I'll just go play with this person's heart for a while. And when I'm tired of it, I'll leave it. They'll find some consolation somewhere else and someone else. They'll get over it. That is an anti Christian mentality, but it exists unchallenged in the church to a large extent, as well as in the world, of course. Each person that you might become romantically interested in is potentially either someone else's future spouse or else they are called to singleness. There are people who are called to perpetual singleness. We'll talk about that in a moment. Paul makes reference to that. Obviously, it would be wrong for you to start arousing emotions in a person's heart that they could not legitimately fulfill if they're called to be single and you go out and, and get romantically involved with them. That, that would be a torture. I mean, you, you think this, the Inquisition was unchristian. Dating is equally unchristian. It's torturing people. Unless, unless you're willing to consummate, and you can't as a Christian, then you shouldn't generate those kinds of cravings in someone else. Now, if that person is called a perpetual singleness, obviously you'd be working against God in trying to get them involved in romantic attraction to you or anyone else. But if they're not called a singleness, and most people are not, as I read Paul, I think most people are not, then that person is, is someone's future husband or wife. Now, they, of course, there's a, there's a chance it might be your future husband and wife, or wife. But until you know that that is the case, you are playing with the heart of somebody else's future husband or wife. My second wife who was killed in an accident was, uh, she knew my best friend before she knew me. Uh, and she was a very wonderful godly woman and, and all the godly men were interested in her. She wasn't as physically attractive as some other women, but I, all the godly men I knew would have, uh, would have sacrificed a, a fashion model to, to have this woman because she was a virtuous woman. And I remember when I was single, all the brothers who were serious about God would sit around and say, where are the virtuous women? No one had the answer. And occasionally one would turn up and then they all want her. They're rare. And you women, maybe you're looking for the virtuous guy. Or I don't know if people are even looking anymore. But, but in, in my day, back in the ancient <laughs> times, spiritual people wanted spiritual spouses. And my second wife was that woman. And the only reason she went for me is because I don't know why. God, uh, God put it in her heart. And... Um, I'm glad he did. But before she knew me, she knew a man who was my best friend. It was actually through him that I was introduced. And before he had introduced her to me, he was somewhat interested in her. They used to go places together. They didn't date. They, he didn't have a car. She had a car. And they went to the same Bible studies and the same events and stuff. And so he rode with her sometimes. And he told, after I married her, he told me, he says, you know what, Steve? He says, it's kind of funny looking back. By the way, he's a really neat brother. He's the guy who wrote a song you may be familiar with. Uh, it's Your Blood. You ever heard that song? It's Your Blood. That it's, a, it's a, one of those vineyard songs. Anyway, he's a vineyard pastor now. But um, anyway, he, um, he said, Steve, it's an interesting thing. He says, I used to, before, before you and June knew each other, June was my second wife, he says, there were times when she and I would be going places together, and I'd be sitting in the car next to her, and, I'd be, and my mind would start thinking, this woman would be a really good wife. But he says, every time that thought came to me, I felt like God spoke to me and said, have nothing to do with her, she's another man's wife. And then he said, he said, I was so pleased when I found out who that other man was, that she was my best friend's wife. But see, the interesting thing is, if, that, if we can credit what he said about God speaking to him, I do, some people might think it's you know, just all subjective, but to me this fits with what I believe is biblically true. 
God knew whose wife she was going to be. My friend Michael didn't know that. He hoped briefly that she, maybe she'd be his, but God said, no, she's another man's wife. What's interesting is she didn't know that man yet, and he didn't know her, but she was his wife as far as God was concerned. Now, the person that you might wish to form a relationship with, unless you know that that's your wife or your husband, then that is, in all likelihood, somebody else's wife or somebody else's husband. What are you going to do with somebody else's wife or somebody else's husband? Let me ask you this. Most of you are not married, but if you were married, obviously you'd be greatly shocked and offended and maybe file for divorce if your spouse committed adultery with some neighbor or the milkman or someone in the office or something. I mean, it'd be absolutely unacceptable behavior. But how would you feel if your spouse did not commit adultery but simply developed a romantic relationship? with one of these people. Would that make you more comfortable? I doubt it. I imagine you would consider that as unacceptable, as adultery. In fact, you would have every reason to believe that it probably would eventually, if, if unchecked, result in adultery. But you wouldn't feel any more wonderful knowing that your spouse had a romantic interest in somebody other than you than you would if you knew that they had a, an affair with them. I, you, there might be more torment in the affair, but there'd be plenty enough in the other. Now, if you are interested in somebody of the opposite sex and they're not your spouse, you should figure probably 95% chance they're someone else's, unless they're one of those few that are called to be single forever, in which case you should leave them alone anyway. Uh, I, had a, I had a woman I was very interested in, and, and on good ground. She was a spiritual woman. I, I wanted to marry her. And she was my best friend in, in one sense. Uh, we, we spent a lot of time together, but we never dated exactly because she wasn't romantically interested in me. She, she enjoyed my company, she said, more than anyone else, and she loved to go everywhere we went together. But she, there was never any romance because she, it wasn't on her side. On my side, there, there was an interest, uh, more than an interest. I, I would have very much been, I would have jumped at the chance to marry her. Um, but, she, you know, it wasn't mutual. But she always said, whenever I brought up the subject, do you think, you know, you'll ever marry? <laughs> How about us, you know? I mean, I, I spoke plainly with her, and she was, I mean, we're good friends. We talked plainly. She always put me off. She said, no, I just feel like I, I want to be married to Jesus. She just feel like, she says, I feel like God wants me to just be married to Jesus, and I would feel like I'm being unfaithful to him if I got romantically interested in another person. I thought, well, I can't argue with that. The person that you're romantically interested in, one of three things. They're either going to be your spouse in the future, someone else's spouse in the future, or Jesus' spouse. They're going to be single for Jesus, like Paul describes some people being. Now, if it's Jesus' spouse, you better keep your hands off, right? Why do you think Joseph was afraid to marry Mary when he found out she was pregnant? Everyone assumes that he didn't believe her story when he tried to put her away. I don't think so. He didn't have her stoned. <clears throat> it doesn't say that he was angry at her, it says he was afraid to marry her. The angel appeared and said, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife. Why? I believe Joseph knew the integrity of that woman. I mean, I'm, I'm sure it boggled his mind, but if she said, honest, Joseph, I haven't slept with anyone. God, an angel appeared to me and, and said that my baby's the Messiah, and it's, it's, I'm a virgin to this day. I mean, he would have, you know, like, it, like the rest of us, you think, well, I don't understand this, but I think he believed her. And I think he felt like... Well, who am I to touch a woman who's God's wife? I mean, in a sense, I mean, this is the woman God's having a baby by. I think I'd better get out of this arrangement, you know? And the answer said, no, don't be afraid to take her. I think he was afraid. I think he thought it was irreverent. I, thought he, I think he probably thought it would be a sacrilege to marry a woman that God had chosen to bring a, a child through the world. Well, I mean, I feel the same way if, 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 if a woman would say to me, uh, you know, I feel like God just wants me married to him and have no husband. I think, okay, you know, I don't want to, don't, you know, be still my heart. I don't want to have any thoughts of the wrong kind toward God's spouse. And there are people, I, not, I mean, figuratively speaking, but I mean, there are people who consecrate themselves just to God and, and, and are given a gift of singleness. Paul talks about this. But if, if a person's not in that category, and most people are not, then the other two possibilities is the person you have a romantic interest in is either your future spouse or someone else's. If they're someone else's, you stay away from them. And the only way you could then 
legitimately allow, allow yourself the luxury of romantic feelings is if you were certain that that person is going to be your spouse. Now, this sounds so strange to our culture because everyone assumes, well, how would I know this was going to be my spouse unless I've already have romantic feelings toward them? And this is the saddest thing about our culture that can be said, is that the assumption is you have to have the romance first, and then based on the presence of that romance, you decide to get married. This is the opposite of the biblical position. I'm not saying romance doesn't have a place in marriage. I, every happy marriage has romance as a leading as one of the leading features. But, but to say that marriage is based on romance, and you know, I mean, this is the stuff of divorce. When people say, I don't feel, we don't feel like we love each other anymore. What do they mean? You choose to love it. You can, I don't feel like I love someone, so what? I have, to I have to decide to love them. That's what the Bible says. What they mean is we don't feel romantic toward each other anymore. And for many people, this is excuse enough to end the marriage because the assumption is romance is the basis of marriage. Where does it say that anywhere in the Scripture? Don't you know how many people in the Bible married people they'd never met in Scripture and lived happily ever after? Now, no one can say that they had romantic feelings toward the person they'd never met. Now, I'm not going to advocate going back to the Jewish culture on all this. You might be afraid that I am. And in a later lecture, I will tell you what I do believe the Bible does teach about the finding of a mate. But let me just challenge the assumption initially that that we always make is that you must have romantic feelings for someone before you could decide whether you'd want to marry them. I don't see why. You can develop romantic feelings toward anyone that, that you find you know, appealing in other respects. I mean, obviously you would not choose to marry someone unless there were things you respected about them and you probably find them somewhat attractive, maybe, maybe very or maybe not so very, but the fact is there are things about them that you decide that's the person I want to raise children with. This is the person I want to spend my life with. That person has character. That person looks good to me. That person has a good personality I enjoy. That person is a good Christian. I could feel safe allowing myself to get romantic with that person. But only after I know for sure that that person is going to be mine for life. Because I'm not going to hurt their heart and I don't want them hurting mine. The world may be used to doing that kind of thing, but it isn't what hearts are made for. It's not what romance is for. And every person that you could possibly be interested in is either your future spouse or someone else's future spouse. And if it's someone else's, you've got no business being with them, even having romantic feelings toward them, any more than you want your spouse to have romantic feelings for someone else. It's amazing how much we've been asleep on this issue. I mean, it's, so, it's as plain as the nose on your face if you think about it in scriptural categories, and yet how many people have even thought about it in our culture, in the church even? Very rarely has the cultural norms been challenged. Let me read you something in 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 3 through 7, Paul said, <clears throat> For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that means that you be holy, that you should abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor. That means control yourself. Not in passion of lust, like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one should take advantage of and defraud his brother in this matter, because the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also forewarned you and testified. Interesting that Paul is warning them not to commit fornication. And yet he says, don't defraud your brother in this matter. I would have thought that if I was a single man and getting something going with a single woman that was immoral, that I'd be defrauding her. Not my brother, that's my sister it may be, but how is it that fornication is defrauding my brother? Well, it can only be one way, as near as I can tell, is that her future husband is the brother I'm defrauding. If I allow a woman to become romantically interested in me, if I touch a woman in such a way as to arouse passions that don't belong between people who are not married, and that woman is not my spouse, She's my brother's spouse in all likelihood, and I'm defrauding him. I'm cheating him out of something that I would prefer no one cheated me out of from my wife. I wish my wife had never had a form of romance, and she surely wishes I had never had one. She's more passionate about it than I am. We've got a lot more to say about this, but we have to take it in small segments, and so I'm going to have to close this session. But let me just say this. I believe the Bible teaches that marriage is the only environment legitimate environment for romance to be permitted to exist. 
That's a radical concept. I'll let you chew on that for a while when we come back to our next session. We're going to talk about the gift of singleness briefly. Then I'm going to talk to you who don't have the gift of singleness and don't have a spouse. Talk about waiting, how you wait, how you prepare, how you control yourself, how you relate with the opposite sex. We'll have to wait for that, though. Until next time.